My name is John. I'm turning 45 this year. Today, I'd really like to share a story with you, a story of emotion, exhilaration, and a bit of serves you right. This story takes us back to my childhood. As a kid, I was a crybaby and slow, far from what you'd call brilliant. Indecisive, unable to make quick decisions, I was always dithering over things. For our summer vacation homework, we had to choose between growing roses or sunflowers. I'm going with sunflowers. I prefer roses. Mr. Hill, can I do both? While my classmates quickly made their choices, I couldn't decide. Sunflowers are synonymous with summer, aren't they? Sunflower seeds are Buster's favorite. My buddy, called Buster, is a Jungarian hamster. With his tiny body and beady eyes, he's absolutely adorable, like a little angel. If I managed to harvest a lot, he'd surely stuff his cheeks and munch away happily. Just imagining it brings a smile to my face. But sunflowers grow surprisingly large. We didn't have the space to grow a big sunflower at home. We do have a yard, but it's filled with my mom's vegetable garden, leaving no room for me. Maybe roses, then. I can grow roses in pots, so they don't need much space. As long as I don't forget to water them, they should grow healthy. If I place the pots in front of my house, our neighbors also can enjoy to see them. Thinking about it makes it even harder to choose. Am I just being greedy? John, you are the only one left. Rose or sunflower, which will it be? Mr. Hill asked. It's John again. Why can't you ever make up your mind quickly? Can't help it. John is just a slow poke toward us. The main character of a popular drama at the time was always messing up, and everyone called her the slow poke toward us. That phrase was quite a hit and even became a trend among us kids. Everyone, quiet down. John, you need to decide by the end of the day. Come to the staff room later to pick it up. Understood. For mischievous kids, a slow poke turtle like me was just too tempting not to tease. Some of them would always pick on me. Hey, slow poke, John, why can't you just hurry up and choose? I'll choose for you. You're getting a sunflower. Sunflower. I like sunflowers, but my yard is too small. Then go for the rose. But if I forget to water it, it'll die. What if I forget? That's your problem. Just don't forget. Let's stop bothering with Slowpoke Sean and play basketball. Let's play basketball. Yeah, let's do it. My classmates ran out of the classroom, eager to play. I wanted to join in on the basketball game, but no one invited me. Being a slowpoke and I often stopped classes. Science and math were fine. Because there's only one right answer. Simple and straightforward, utterly basic. There's no need to fret. The problem is, yes, language arts. When faced with vague questions like what do you think the author was feeling at this time, I'm at a loss. How am I supposed to know what the authors felt? I've never met the authors, nor do I know their thoughts behind their writing. How can everyone else ponder the feelings of strangers and come up with answers? Suddenly it started raining, and I took shelter. The rain stopped quickly, so I started walking again. What were the feelings? Maybe they're thrilled, thinking, yes, the rain stopped, or perhaps they're disappointed, thinking, now I have to walk again. Or maybe they're just wondering why the rain stopped so suddenly. Of course, there's a context to every story. By carefully unraveling the context, one might glimpse the author's emotions. But if suddenly called upon during class, I have to respond immediately. During exams, I have to figure it out within the allotted time. That's when I give up. Anxiety overwhelms me and my thoughts can keep up. The more I rush to answer, the more my mind spins, leaving my answer sheet blank. 
Alex, a classmate, is smart and wealthy, reigning as the leader of the rambunctious group. Alex seems frustrated with my slow pace. Because you can't answer quickly, you're holding up the class. Sorry, Alex. You're always like this. How can you not understand such a simple question? I know the answer, but I'm not sure if it's really correct. Oh, what are you talking about? If you know it, just answer. It's okay even if it's wrong. I hate making mistakes. If I do, everyone will laugh at me. Cut it out. Your attitude is so irritating. Look, I have exams next year. I don't have time to waste. If I fail my exams, it's your fault. Alex, despite his mischief, is bright and plans to take the entrance exam for a prestigious private middle school next year. He's intelligent, athletic, and well-liked. Sorry, Alex, but how can anyone know what the offer felt unless they're the offer themselves? Isn't it strange to even ask such a question? Listen, John, if it's a question, it means many people recognize its significance. Understand. Has everyone talked to the author? Man, you always nitpick. Is that why you can't score well? Is my thinking really just nitpicking? To truly understand an author's feelings, wouldn't you need to read the entire book? When asked what do you think, based on an excerpt, I have no choice but to surrender, saying, I don't know. Isn't that the normal response? John, you are really slow. Being slow and bad at studying is the worst. Alex's face, filled with disdain, seems triumphant, yet also twisted with irony. Summer vacation is paradise. I can relax without seeing Alex. But that was a big mistake. During the summer, I was sent to supplemental classes to study. I don't want to go to the classes, I protested desperately. But my mother said, John, you're always failing. If you don't work hard over the summer vacation to catch up, the second term will be tough. It's not that I don't know the answers. The exam time is just too short. Don't make excuses. You fail because you don't understand the material. No, mom, that's not it. Besides, everyone has the same amount of exam time. If other kids can do it, why can't you do? If you don't understand, you should ask for help. If you don't work hard now, you'll struggle as an adult. It's not because I don't understand, I tell you. My words don't reach my mother. Reluctantly, I ended up attending supplemental classes where Alex was present. He was the leader there too. John, huh? Do you really think you can keep up here? I didn't want to come, but my mom. Are you treated like a slow poke at home too? That's sad. No, it's not like that. Hey, everyone, be careful around this guy. He's slow, sluggish, and a complainer. John, just don't get in the way of our studies, okay? Yeah, I got it. Despite that, I was left behind even at the supplemental classes. This school was one of the top classes in the city, known for its fast-paced studies. The instructors spoke as fast as an express train. I couldn't keep up as the discussion moved faster than I could digest the information. Air. Before I knew it, the class was over. Alex, can I ask you something? I didn't understand a part from earlier. Could you explain it to me? Why should I have to teach you? I have another class now. Didn't I tell you not to drag us down? You're not just slow. You're incompetent. Change your name to Incompetent John. I'm not incompetent. Slow, sluggish, and incompetent John. I bet you even killed your rose, right? Behind Alex, the other students smirked. Ah, it's no use with them. They are completely on Alex's side. I don't want to go to the supplemental classes anymore. When I get home, how is it, John? Can you keep up with the studies there? Mom, I want to quit the supplemental classes. What are you saying? You're going to be a middle school student next year. You have to study hard now, or you'll fall behind. Hey, Mom, 
It's not that I don't understand the studies. I know the answers, but... I told you not to make excuses. Have you done your homework? And you better take care of the roses or else. Mom, the roses, it bloomed beautifully, you know. Hey mom, are you really looking at me in the flower? The summer vacation that was supposed to be fun ended up being just painful, hot, and misunderstood by everyone. After summer, fall came. A transfer student arrived in my class. This is Ryan Thompson. Ryan is good at studying, so you all might want to learn from him. I'm Ryan. Nice to meet you. Ryan, who came from the city, had a sharp and tall appearance, giving off an intellectual vibe. The girls were all abuzz and restless. In a few years, he'll surely become a top tire handsome guy, his presence not the least bit annoying. But probably, Alex won't like him. Sure enough, during break time, Alex started to mess with Ryan. Ryan, where are you from? New York. Huh? Transferring at this time of year, did your parents do something bad? What do you mean? Like his parents messed up and got demoted here. That's not true. My parents aren't bad people. Then what is it? My dad is taking over my grandfather's company, so we came here together. Which company? Pinecrest Construction. Pinecrest Construction, seriously? Yeah, seriously. Alex seemed to have a complex expression on his face before leaving the classroom. Alex, wait up, what's wrong? His entourage hurriedly followed him. That guy seems pretty full of himself. Is he always like that? Ryan spoke to me. Yeah, Alex is always like that. He's the smartest in this class, so everyone clings to him. Smart, huh? Jay, probably. The conversation didn't go much further. Once Alex was gone, the girls surrounded Ryan instead. It seems that the mysterious and handsome transfer student being popular isn't just a story found in movie or drama series. One day, on my way home, I stopped by my secret base. A dilapidated little shack, quietly standing in the corner of a vacant lot. Too shabby for anyone to care about, this shack was my secret haven. I love this place where I can relax and read a book without anyone disturbing me or making fun of me. On days when my mom was out working part-time, I'd kill time here. I was supposed to be at supplemental classes, but that place felt suffocating. So, I'd chill at my secret base until supplemental classes was supposed to end. Today, I borrowed an animal encyclopedia from the library. I wanted to learn more about the habitat of Jungarian hamsters, so Buster could live more comfortably. Humming to myself, I headed to the shack when I spotted a cardboard box on the vacant lot. Hearing some noise, I peeked inside and found newborn kitten meowing. Looking around, there was no sign of her mother cat. Nor was there anyone who might have abandoned her. What should I do? I already have Buster at home so I can't take her with me. Maybe I should bring some milk from home. No, that's not right. If you're going to start something, you have to take responsibility until the end. When we got Buster, my dad gave me a stern talking to. Once you've intervened, you can't just abandon them halfway. You have to take care of them for the rest of their lives. That's what it means to own a pet to take life into your hands, apparently. What should I do? But if I leave her here, this kitten will surely die. I decided to take the kitten to my secret base. However, I didn't know what to do next. The animal encyclopedia had information on every imaginable animal from around the world, but it didn't have a manual on how to care for kittens. What should I do? How do I take care of such small kitten? For now, I decided to go home and bring back some milk and bread. Wait here, I'll be right back. I spoke to the kitten and dashed home. 
When I got home, my mom was there. John, what about supplemental classes? Mom, weren't you supposed to be at work today? I had a headache, so I took a day off. But never mind that, what about supplemental classes? I'm going now. I just got a bit hungry, so I came to get some bread and milk. Are you going to eat that at supplemental classes? Yeah. That's not acceptable. It's embarrassing. I'll have dinner ready for you as soon as you get back, so hurry up and go. But. Hurry up. You're really slow. I wonder who you take after. Luckily, the phone rang at just the right time. While my mother was on the phone, I quietly took some milk from the fridge. I decided to give up on the bread. The kitten probably couldn't eat it anyway. I returned to the base and fed the kitten the milk. Ideally, I should use a baby bottle or a dropper, as I've seen on TV. But since I didn't have such things, I dipped my finger in the milk and let her lick it off. She must have been very hangry because she sicked on my finger vigorously. Her strength was surprisingly strong, conveying a strong will to live. Are you all alone too? Being alone is lonely, huh? But I can't take you home. I decided to keep the kitten at my secret base. I named her Muffin. She was brown with stripes, and her big, round eyes reminded me of a female anime character. From that day on, I pretended to go to supplemental classes but actually went to see Muffin. As I took care of her, I became adept at stimulating her to pee and poop by gently tapping her with a tissue. After a few days, Muffin started to see and move around. Muffin, don't go there, it's dangerous. Though I called out, Muffin didn't seem to understand. As I was cleaning up the mess Muffin made, she disappeared. Muffin, where did you go? Muffin. I turned pale and dashed out of the shack. Where is she? Where did she go? It's dangerous for such a tiny one to be outside. I need to find her quickly. As I frantically searched, I heard a voice from behind. John, what are you doing here? Turning around, I saw Ryan. Aunt Ryan, have you seen a cat? A brown striped one with round eyes. Your cat? Yeah, her name is Muffin. She ran off somewhere. It seems so. I must have had a pretty pitiful look on my face. Ryan peered at me with a worried expression. All right, let's look for her together. Really? Of course. With that, Ryan helped me search for Muffin. Winter evenings bring early nights, and the surroundings have already become completely dark. We peered into the overgrown bushes, but there was no sign of Muffin. Meow, meow. A faint cry came from somewhere. There, John, over there, isn't that her? It seems Muffin had crawled between some pieces of wood. Ryan carefully, gently, and slowly pulled Muffin out, making sure she didn't get hurt. Muffin, I'm so relieved. This little one's leg is injured. Where? I could see something like blood on her back leg. Maybe she cut it on the wood. We should take her to a vet. At this hour, they should still be one open. I can take her to a vet. Why not? As I hesitated to answer, Ryan seemed to understand. Are you keeping her secretly in that shack? Yeah, it's my secret base. Can't you take her home? I have a Jungarian hamster at home. But it's cruel to leave her like this. Okay, I'll take her in. Really? Are you sure? My family loves animals. Besides, this one is so cute, they'll definitely allow it. Thank you, Ryan. I'm counting on you. And so, Muffin became Muffin Fompson. Ryan took Muffin to the vet that same day. Fortunately, the injury wasn't serious, and the vet said it would heal in a few days. This incident brought Ryan and me closer together. I visited Ryan's house almost every day to check on Muffin. 
The time spent with Ryan and Muffin was incredibly fun and flew by quickly. John, you're not bad at studying. It's more like you overthink things and take too long to come to an answer. Do you get frustrated with me, Ryan? I don't get frustrated. I just see that you're really trying hard, but that must be tough during tests, right? Yeah, I run out of time. It's because you overthink, John. You're not dumb. You just lack decisiveness because you overthink. But how can I be sure it's the right answer? John, you're like someone at a crosswalk who looks right, then left, then right again, and left again, and still worries about cars coming, looking back and forth again. If you keep doing that, you'll never cross the street. Checking is important though. Yes, but if you only keep checking, you won't move forward. Just trust your first instinct and write it down on the answer sheet. What if it's wrong? Then you just have to get it right next time. Stop pondering and just write down the first answer that comes to your mind. After school, Ryan and I practiced solving practice questions. We timed ourselves to finish within a set period. Whether it was right or wrong was secondary. The main aim was to produce an answer. John, don't hesitate. You're not bad at studying. You just have a habit of worrying. If you organize your thoughts and eliminate your doubts, your grades will improve quickly. Ryan's advice was beyond his years. Really smart people are amazing. Thanks to Ryan, I gradually became able to solve problems within the time limit. Ryan and I had Muffin in common. The more time we spent together, the deeper our friendship grew. For the first time in my life, I felt like I had a best friend. But there was someone who didn't find our friendship amusing. It was Alex. Hey, Ryan, if you hang out with incompetent John, you'll become incompetent too. John isn't incompetent. Who knows, he might even score better than you on the next test. That's impossible because this guy can't keep up with his studies and is always skipping supplemental classes. John, were you going to supplemental classes? Ah, uh, well, sort of. I told my mom I didn't want to go, but she signed me up anyway. Um. Suddenly, an incident happened. There were consecutive incidents in the neighborhood where cats were being injured. Most were stray cats, but some were beloved pets. After several such incidents, a big fuss arose when the cat of Emily, one of classmates, was found in a tragic state. The discovery was made near my secret base, and somehow, I was treated as the suspect. John, you were handing around that old shack, right? What were you doing there, enjoying herding cats? No, I was just reading books. That's right, John wouldn't do such a thing. Ryan was on my side. Even when everyone looked at me with suspicion, only Ryan insisted on my innocence. I saw you playing with a cat there, chasing around a brown striped one. Me too. You were chasing that brown striped cat. Brown striped cat. No. No. See, there are witnesses. Be honest, did you do something to Emily's cat, not just her cat? Have you been hurting the neighborhood cats recently? No, it's not me. John, the brown striped cat. Could it be that when Muffin hurt her leg that time? Ryan, no, I didn't hurt Muffin. Ryan, believe me. Don't look at me like that. The rumor spread quickly throughout the school and I was called into the staff room. My parents were called and even the police questioned me. There was no evidence that I had hurt any cats. Of course not, because I hadn't done it. But from that day on, Ryan stopped looking at me. I no longer belonged anywhere. A child like you, I can keep you at home. It's terrifying. My mother, who believed I was attending supplemental classes, couldn't forgive me for lying. The neighbor's eyes were harsh too. To my mother, I had become an unwanted child. I was sent to live with my paternal grandparents. 
The move was to a peaceful countryside where no one knew me. The entire area was laid back, which suited my slow pace. The study pace here was relaxed, and I, who was inherently good at studying, became an honor student. But living with my grandparents wasn't comfortable. They knew why I had been sent away. Even if I said I hadn't done it, they didn't believe me. Not even my parents believed me, so it was probably expected. I managed until high school, but I couldn't take it any more beyond that. I wanted to go to college, but there was no money for it. I moved to New York and looked for a living job. No matter how good I was at studying, the only jobs available for a high school graduate like me were in manual labor. But I worked hard. As long as I kept my body moving and sweated it out, I didn't have to think about anything else. I just kept working hard, letting the days pass by. It had been about five years since I started working. Why don't you try for the promotion exam? Kevin, my boss, who was pleased with my work, suggested it to me. But I only had a high school diploma. Your educational background doesn't matter for the promotion exam. You work harder than anyone else here. Your work is meticulous and reliable. Sure, you might be a bit slower, but that's because you don't neglect the details. Even if you're slow, you always meet the deadlines. Everyone says they feel relieved when you're handling things. I was delighted. No one had ever valued me like this before. I have high hopes for you. You might even become a candidate for an executive position in the future. That's impossible. I couldn't be that presumptuous. Just being recognized like this was enough for me. Anyway, make sure you take the next exam, okay? Understood. People get motivated when they are expected to do well. I studied hard. Balancing work and study was tough, but the study methods Ryan taught me were very helpful. Even now, Ryan was helping me out. It's ironic, isn't it? After pausing the promotion exam, I was promoted smoothly. While working as a construction manager, I became interested in design and obtained my architect's license. Further fueled by my hobby, I even challenged myself to become an interior coordinator. I, who always loved studying since childhood, was filled with the joy of encountering new knowledge. Enjoying studying led to promotions and salary increases. There was nothing more interesting than this. By the time I was 40, I had been promoted to branch manager. It was rare for someone who started with just a high school diploma to climb this high. In fact, I was the first. Kevin prioritized ability over educational background. He had always looked out for me in many ways. John, are you free tomorrow? In the evening, yes, no problem. Then, let's meet at Summit Steak at 7 p.m. Okay. Summit Steak is a high-end steak restaurant located in a prime area of Manhattan. I had been there for Kevin's chauffeuring but never for a meal. A place where just sitting down could easily cost a fortune was not somewhere I could afford to go. Being invited to such a place, what kind of discussion could possibly unfold? First things first, I needed to prepare a suit. There was no way I could go there in my work clothes. As soon as the work day ended, I dashed out of the office and headed to a suit store. And then, the next day, with a mix of anticipation, confusion, and anxiety, I entered the restaurant. Welcome, we've been expecting you. You're John, right? As expected of a high-end restaurant. There was no cheerful hey, welcome, greeting. As I was led into the room, to my surprise, the president, Mr. Anderson, was there. I had seen him in morning assembly videos, but this was the first time meeting him in person. Why was Mr. Anderson here? Is this your first time meeting Mr. Anderson, John? Yes. It's my first time. It's an honor to meet you. I'm John. You don't need to be so nervous. Please, 
Have a seat. Yes, thank you. It was impossible not to be nervous. I've heard about you from Kevin. You're very studious, and your work is both meticulous and accurate. I'm honored. Actually, we're planning to establish a new development planning division within one of our group subsidiaries. I'd like you, John, to take on the role of division head. What? Time seemed to stop at this sudden proposal. John, this is a big opportunity. You might not get a chance like this again. Don't just stand there. Give a proper response. Yay, yes. What do you say, John? Would you be willing to take on the role? But Mr. Anderson, I only have a high school diploma, and I don't have the kind of career background that everyone else has. Can someone like me really handle being a division head? You must have gone through a lot to get here, right? I can tell by looking at your hands. They're the hands of a hard worker. I myself worked my way up from the field. I believe I have an eye for seeing how people approach their work. Mr. Anderson's words had a transformative impact on my life, filled with frustration until now. I will do my utmost. Thank you for this opportunity. Both Mr. Anderson and Kevin had truly seen me for who I was. I was determined to repay their kindness with good work. All right, that settles it. No more serious talk, let's drink. The rest of the evening felt like a dream. I was deeply moved by Mr. Anderson's stories of his struggles. I learned a lot about what it means to be a leader. Having drunk a bit too much, I excused myself to the restroom. What a wonderful feeling. Such good wine. Finally, the spotlight seemed to be on my life. Lost in my euphoric thoughts, I was suddenly approached. Hey, isn't that John? I turned around, and there was someone I never wanted to remember again. Cut it be, Alex. It had been since elementary school graduation, over 30 years since we last met. Yet, I instantly recalled the nightmares of my childhood. It is you, John. Long time no see. What are you doing here? Just having dinner. Dinner of you, here. How can someone incompetent like you afford a place like this? Your face and hands are all dirty. What? Are you doing manual labor? That suit doesn't suit you at all. Did you get the wrong place or something? Classic John. Always slow and incompetent. Just get out of here. No, I'm not mistaken. I'm having dinner here. Stop it, will you? Today, we're celebrating my promotion to president. In the next personal change, I'll become the president. It's different for someone like you who does physical labor. It may bring bad luck. Could you please leave? President, that's impressive. Which company's president are you becoming? A subsidiary of Pinecrest Construction. Pinecrest Construction. You remember Ryan's company, right? Ryan. His father was the president of Pinecrest Construction. So, Alex must have ingratiated himself with Ryan and made it this far. Is that why he saw me as an obstacle? Perhaps the whole cat incident was Alex's doing. Don't speak so casually to the next president of the Great Pinecrest Group, you incompetent John. The door opened and Kevin appeared. John, who is this person? He's Alex, a classmate from my elementary school days. He's about to become the president of a subsidiary of Pinecrest Construction. Mr. Anderson's displeased face was visible beyond the door. I recognized that expression as the one Mr. Anderson had when he was furious about an employee's misconduct. This was bad. Alex, unfortunately, that position is no longer available to you. What? What are you talking about? That's my line, Alex. I heard what you were saying. Your voice was quite loud, so it naturally reached my ears. John, who are these people? Alex hadn't changed. He was still arrogant in front of anyone. I have no intention of interesting my company to someone who looks down on others and uses foul language. Your promotion is canceled. What? 
Alex, this is Mr. Anderson of Pinecrest Holdings. Huh? The company I work for is part of the Pinecrest Holdings Group, and Ryan's father's company, Pinecrest Construction, is also a member of the group. The subsidiary Alex was about to become president of was even further down the hierarchy. In terms of position, I was above him. You, why is someone as incompetent as you above me? Watch your mouth. John has worked harder than anyone to get here. There's no way someone as arrogant and conceited as you should be calling him incompetent. You should be ashamed. What did you say, you old fool? Alex, who spewed insults and tried to lunge at Mr. Anderson, was stopped by colleagues who heard the commotion. Ryan was among them, but I pretended not to notice. Alex's misconduct became known throughout the group, and he was transferred to a subcontractor of a subsidiary. It seems Ryan also faced demotion for bearing some responsibility. Thanks to Ryan, I became more efficient at handling tasks. I'm deeply grateful for that, but I cannot forget the coldness of him doubting me and turning away. However, it's true that their actions taught me pain and made me kinder. There's a saying about learning from negative examples. I'll never forget the emotional scars I received that day, but I'll strive to be kind, sincere, and genuinely engage with everyone. That's the least I can do as a leader. I'll nurture myself, my team, and grow the company into something even more essential to society, repaying those who believed in me and pulled me up.